All right. Well, we're approaching 12.05 and we're approaching 100 participants, so we might as well get started. So good morning, afternoon, uh, or evening, everyone, depending where you are in the world. It looks like we might have a, a pretty good geography of people listening today. So my name is Adam Kirkwood, and I'm a PhD candidate in permafrost science, and I'm in Sudbury, uh, Ontario, Canada right now. Uh, I'm the vice president of the Permafrost Young Researchers Network, or PERN. And joining me right now as a panelist is Yudita Schmidt. Uh, she's another super awesome member of our PERN executive committee. So today, PERN is really excited to welcome you to our short course on permafrost science and cold regions engineering. Uh, the PERN committee, the Canadian Permafrost Association, the United States Permafrost Association, and the International Permafrost Association have worked really hard over the past few months to develop what we hope will be a really awesome short course with four lectures and a final discussion on permafrost science and engineering. So I wanted to introduce the course a little bit and to explain why we thought of creating this course. And every few years, there's joint conferences on permafrost science and cold regions engineering, like the upcoming uh, regional conference on permafrost and the international conference on cold regions engineering that's being hosted online in late October. Uh, by the U.S. Permafrost Association. And so at this conference and other conferences like it, permafrost scientists and engineers come together to give presentations. Each individual discipline has their own uh, unique methods and uh, whatnot. So we figured that this course leading up to the conference would allow for really good discussions on how to work together and how to understand how permafrost environments are changing and how we can safely develop in the north as climate continues to change. So like I just mentioned, permafrost scientists and cold regions engineers very often find themselves working together. Uh, and this is very important because you can see from these pictures like this immense amount of ice right beneath the ground uh, or this retrogressive thaw slump in the Western Canadian Arctic, or even this huge lowland just filled with ponds and ground ice <clears throat> for that stretch for as far as you can see. These are very complex environments. And because they're so complex and they're ever changing, it's really important to understand how we can safely build. So things like linear infrastructure, bringing electricity to northern communities or connection by rail or by road to build sustainable and safe airports that are long lasting up in the north on permafrost and to support the development of northern communities as they expand. And so this is exactly why we find permafrost scientists and engineers working together. So permafrost science more thinking of what is happening in this landscape? How is it changing? Why is the landscape looking like this? And then working with cold regions engineers to think how can we take these complex environments and safely develop infrastructure? So that's a bit of the background of why we decided to run this course. And I hope that by the end of it, we'll all be able to have a really good discussion on how permafrost scientists and cold regions engineers can work together. So I figured that I would go over the course outline since it's our first time talking with each other and to briefly introduce our speakers. So we'll have a five week course with about one to one and a half hour meetings per week, depending on the length of the lecture. And it's going to be every Wednesday at this time. So for me, it's 12 p.m. Eastern time. And so the first speaker we have who we're going to hear from today is Dr. Ashley Rudy, who is a permafrost uh, geoscientist at the Northwest Territories Geological Survey. Next week, we'll be hearing from Dr. Simon Dumais, who is a cold regions engineer at the Royal Military College of Canada. Next, we'll be hearing from Dr. Ugs Lentuit, another uh, permafrost geomorphologist at the Alfred Wegener Institute, and he's the coordinator of the Unitariac project. 
They'll be talking to us about permafrost science. And then finally, we'll have Dr. Guy Doré, who's a cold regions engineer at the University of Laval. Uh, all of these speakers are very highly regarded in their fields and they're award-winning scientists and engineers. And they have really extensive background on the topics that they're gonna be presenting to us about. And so we're very thrilled and we're very happy that we get to learn from them and listen to them and hear about their expertise. And like I mentioned today, we're excited to hear from Dr. Ashley Rudy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Rudy is on holidays, but she provided us with a really great pre-recorded lecture. Uh, and she won't be able to answer questions at the end, but we have thought of a little bit of an alternative that we're really hoping will work well. So I wanna take a second to just discuss what we're hoping to do for questions. So we'll have our 45 minute lecture. Um, and then unfortunately, because you won't be able to answer questions, we're gonna do it a little differently. So you'll see that on this Zoom webinar function, we have a question and answer function, and we also have a chat function. So if at any time you're listening to the lecture and you have a question, feel free to put your question in the question box. And then it's open for all of the, pan or all of the participants and the attendees of this lecture to chat amongst each other. So if uh, I've looked at the audience, we have quite a few experienced cold regions engineers and permafrost scientists here. So please feel free to answer questions if it uh, is within your wheelhouse. And then later at the end, if we do have some really good questions, perhaps we can bring some members of the audience uh, on as a panelist and we can discuss that. Or myself or Yudita can copy down the questions that'll be in the chat and we can have Dr. Rudy answer them when she joins us for the panel discussion at the end. So before we get started, I wanted to do a little bit of a poll because I know that sometimes the Zoom webinars can be a little bit impersonal because we can't all see each other, uh, but there are nearly a hundred of us here, which is really awesome. So I wanted to take a chance to launch some polls to figure out where you're from, uh, maybe you're an undergrad or a PhD student. So hopefully you can all see this. So I'm curious about whether you're undergraduate, master's, PhD. Oh, kind of all over the place. It's awesome. So I'll share these results and hopefully you can see it. It looks like we have a, a really good mix of between undergrad to PhD and postdoc. And I've seen some professors and consultants in the audience. So we have a really good mix of expertise with us today. So it's very exciting. Next question I wanna ask is what is your background? Are you predominantly a permafrost scientist or are you a cold regions engineer? All right, so it looks like uh, we have a perfect 60-40 split. So we have about 60% of people who are permafrost scientists and about 40% who are cold region engineers. So this is kind of perfect. This is exactly what we were aiming for, hoping to get a mix of everyone so we can really all learn from each other. And then the last question, and you can feel free to answer this more specifically in the chat as well, is where are you from? Do we have many Europeans? South American, North Americans. Oh my God, we actually have a person from Antarctica here. That's so cool. And Africa. Oh, I'm just looking at the chat here and Shannon says I'm not able to see the poll results. That sucks, but I guess I'm kind of like 
live narrating it as we go, like a, a sports game or something. <laughs> um, well, I'll live narrate this one as well. We're mostly a North American audience, but there's still, we have someone from every continent, uh, someone from Africa, Antarctica, Australia, quite a few from Asia and Europe, um, and some from South America. So we're all over the place. And if you want, you can throw specifically where you are in the chat, say hello to other people you see in the chat that you know, and uh, we'll go from there. Oh, share results. All right. So now that we all kind of had a, a brief introduction to each other and what the course is, we can get started. So I'm going to stop sharing this. And now, All right, so hopefully you can all hear me well and that you can see this. If you're having any troubles hearing or seeing, you can send a message in the chat. Um, we are streaming a video through the internet, so at some parts it may get choppy, but hopefully my internet will hold up. Um, but if it is being problematic for you, we are hoping to upload this to the Pern YouTube channel later on. So without further ado, I present to you Dr. Ashley Rudy with our first lecture on permafrost science. Uh, I hope you all enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the first session of the Introduction to Permafrost Science and Cold Regions Engineering, being held by PERN, the Canadian Permafrost Association, and the United States Permafrost Association, in preparation for the Regional Conference on Permafrost. My name is Dr. Ashley Rudy, and I'm a permafrost geohazard scientist with the Northwest Territories Geological Survey in Yellowknife, and I'm really happy to present the first session, which is Permafrost Science 1. I've lived in Yellowknife for the last two and a half years and I've really enjoyed my time working at the survey as the research we do here has really direct applications to uh, people living in the north, which you see firsthand living in a permafrost region. Prior to this, I completed my PhD at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario in the Department of Geography and Planning. I then followed that with a permafrost research associate position at Wilfrid Laurier University and then a short postdoc at the Geological Survey of Canada. And over this period of time, I've completed 12 years of fieldwork across the Canadian High Arctic and Low Arctic. So during grad school and um, after grad school, I've had the opportunity to work across the Canadian High Arctic and Low Arctic, ranging from the Fashan Peninsula up on Ellesmere Island, I spent quite a bit of time on Melville Island on the Sabine Peninsula and at Cape Bounty, which is a long-term monitoring station and uh, research camp. camp. Uh, and then I did some work on Banks Island, and then more recently, and been spending quite a bit of time in the Northwest Territories, which is a location I'll refer to quite a bit, uh, and where I've done work in the Beaufort Delta, in Inuvik, and around there, around the Peel Plateau, uh, some work in and around Norman Wells, which is a community on the near the Mackenzie Mountains, and then obviously Yellowknife, uh, and then some work in the discontinuous sporadic permafrost zone. Um, near uh, Fort Simpson and then some in Northern BC. So across this, across the last 12 years, I've had this opportunity to work in all these regions has really expanded my understanding of how permafrost landscapes are changing um, and some of those drivers. Permafrost landscapes cover a large portion of the earth. And as you'd expect with this vast geographic extent, the landscape in these domains and their surface expression varies widely, which makes it a very interesting yet complicated field of research. These photos are great examples of this variability with the photo on the left showcasing discontinuous sporadic permafrost from Ibisco, Sweden. And then the photo on the right highlighting permafrost or continuous permafrost near Polituck in the northeastern part of the Northwest Territories. Today I'm going to walk you through some of the basics of permafrost science, including what exactly it is, where and when did it form and its extent. Also touching on the different aspects of permafrost, including the active layer, its thermal regime, and perhaps most importantly, the different types of ground ice we might expect to find in permafrost. This will lead into permafrost formation and degradation, the resulting landforms and increasingly uh, becoming more important, the types of thermocarst landforms we're seeing within these permafrost landscapes. I'll then end with climate change and permafrost. Permafrost is a phenomenon directly related to climate. It's ground, such as soil, rock, or organic material, that remains at a temperature of zero degrees Celsius or lower for at least two consecutive years. Much of permafrost is also thousands of years old. This is an important area of research as permafrost regions occupy approximately 25% of the Northern Hemisphere's terrestrial surface. 
Warming, thawing, and degradation of permafrost is likely to accelerate in the future as a result of climate change. A typical classification uh, within permafrost regions uh, recognizes continuous permafrost as underlying 90 to 100% of the landscape, discontinuous permafrost underlying 50 to 90% of the landscape, and sporadic permafrost representing 0 to 50% of the landscape. And we can see these permafrost extents outlined in the circumpolar map on the right hand side. Permafrost is related to climate and surface and lithologic properties, including snow and soil thermal, thermal characteristics. And we know that past climate changes have played a key role in its formation. Most of the permafrost existing today formed during cold glacial periods and has persisted through warmer interglacial periods, including the Holocene Epoch. This geologic epoch began approximately 11,700 years ago and lasted for 10,000 years. Some relatively shallow permafrost, approximately 30 to 70 meters thick, formed during the second part of the Holocene, which lasted about 6,000 years. And some formed during the Little Ice Age, which was approximately 400 to 150 years ago. Permafrost is the result of cold climate conditions, so there are direct associations between air and permafrost temperatures. This is reflected in the geographic distribution of permafrost, which is associated with basic factors that define regional and local surface climate conditions, such as air temperature, precipitation, topography, vegetation cover type, soil organic layers, and particularly snow cover thickness and duration. The thickness of permafrost, its temperature, and its granite content, as well as what proportion of the terrain it underlies, varies greatly. Permafrost thickness relates primarily to air temperature, thermal properties of earth materials, and the geothermal gradient. This variability is summed up nicely in the figure, which is a geographic transect from Kogletuk, located on the Arctic Ocean in Nunavut, to high level in northern Alberta, Canada. On the tundra in the north, air temperatures are cold and continuous permafrost is up to 400 meters thick. Permafrost thicknesses decrease as we move southward with increasing mean annual air temperatures. As we move through Yellowknife, permafrost is discontinuous and often less than 50 meters in thickness. In the sporadic discontinuous permafrost zone, isolated patches of permafrost may only be a few meters thick. The mean annual ground temperature provides one index of permafrost thermal conditions that can be compared between sites and regions. In the high Arctic, mean annual ground temperatures may be as low as negative 15 degrees Celsius, whereas permafrost temperatures in the discontinuous permafrost zone around Yellowknife are typically above negative two degrees C. So let's just sum up the basics of continuous and discontinuous permafrost. So continuous permafrost is often colder, thicker, older, and continuous in space and time. It occurs where climate is the coldest, which is often at the high altitudes and high latitudes. It's interesting because warming, uh, these regions are warming rapidly due to climate change and associated with large volumes of ground ice, which is something I'll discuss in some future slides. But when ground ice melts, the ground subsides and liquid water is released, which can do a lot of geomorphic work, causing a lot of change. Discontinuous permafrost, on the other hand, is just a few degrees below zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, where climate is warmer and surface conditions are just right uh, to maintain that permafrost in equilibrium. So we're talking about vegetation, soil, and snow conditions. Here, the link between climate and permafrost is complicated by those surface characteristics. So predicting where permafrost is and how it might change with a warming climate is quite challenging. The ground thermal regime is impacted by climatic and terrain factors such as relief, vegetation, hydrology, snow cover, and soil and rock type. It can be represented by an annual ground temperature envelope as we see in the figure on the left. The near surface layer that thaws in the summer and freezes in the winter is termed the active layer. Seasonal temperature variations, including the T-max or maximum temperature, which is the red line, and the T-min or minimum temperature, which is the blue line, decrease to the depth of zero annual amplitude. Here, temperatures remain more or less constant throughout the year. Variation in air temperatures and the nature of the underlying earth materials influence the depth of zero annual amplitude. In warm permafrost comprised of icy fine grained soils, the depth of zero annual amplitude can be close to the ground surface because energy is consumed as water and soil pores thaw or freeze. In cold continuous permafrost or in bedrock, ground temperatures may vary seasonally to depths exceeding 15 degrees, sorry, exceeding 15 meters. Under equilibrium conditions, ground temperatures increase below the depth of zero annual amplitude to the base of permafrost due to the geothermal heat flux, and this is called the thermal gradient. If we change the climatic conditions or 
there's a disturbance at the ground surface, we can increase permafrost temperatures. So here's an example where uh, Tmax increases possibly due to increasing air temperatures. This results in a shift to the right uh, and as well as a deepening active layer and thinning of the permafrost. In permafrost terrain, there's a general southward increase in active layer thicknesses, mainly due to increases in summer air temperatures. However, again, differences in climate, soil, vegetation, drainage, and snow conditions cause significant local variation. In this example, shrubs collect snow, which has an insulating effect on the active layer, leading to a deepening and thaw of the near surface permafrost. In continuous permafrost, active layer thicknesses ranges from about 0.3 meters in organic soil to more than one meter in dry sandy soils. The active layer in bedrock may be several meters thick. Again, subarctic spruce forests with thick organic soils may have maximum active layers less than 0.06 meters thick, but barren tundra can thaw to depths of 2.0 meters in coarse grain soils or shallow bedrock areas with a southern exposure. There's just a lot of variability in active layer, again, which is just a reflection of all those different characteristics, which needs to be taken into account when looking at active layer variability. There's a zone at the top of the permafrost which can become part of the active layer during periods of climate warming or following disturbances such as fire. This then reverts back to permafrost as the active layer thins after vegetation recovery or climate cooling. And this is called the transient layer or intermediate layer. And it's a common feature of permafrost throughout the subarctic boreal region. The three layer model of, act, of the active layer permafrost interface includes, again, just the active layer, this freezes and thaws seasonally, uh, the transient layer, which is not always the case, but is common again in the subarctic boreal region. This is an area where there's higher ice content uh, and freezes and thaws at a decadal to century scale. And then we have the long-term permafrost, which is freezing and thawing at the century to millennial scale. Again, this is ground that remains below zero for two or more consecutive years. And we see this uh, in this photo uh, on the right-hand side here, we have the base of the active layer, which is at about one meter. Uh, below this, we have an icer-rich transient layer uh, which is technically part of the permafrost um, and then below that we have an area of uh, segregated ice which i'll talk about when we discuss uh, ground ice types the active layer is an important component of permafrost environments as it buffers the effect of climate change on permafrost so here we have the active layer overlying ice rich permafrost uh, and the permafrost is ice rich due to segregated ice lenses uh, indicated by these dashed lines. So if we have a disturbance to the active layer or remove a portion of the active layer, this can cause the active layer thickness to increase. When the active layer thaws into ice rich permafrost, this leads to the melt of that ice and its removal and ultimately surface subsidence. So here we have the post disturbance active layer, which is thicker than the initial active layer, and we have thinning of the ice rich permafrost. So this ultimately can have a major effect on ground stability particularly in ice-rich terrain. So on the right-hand side, we have a photo of a road. So this is a road near Yellowknife where we have these dips where we had thaw within ice-rich permafrost, ultimately creating a very uneven road surface. And then the photo below is from an ice-rich permafrost up on Melville Island where we had pockets or we had some deeper uh, thaw and subsidence leading to the increase in ponding and ultimately you know, leading to more subsidence to uh, so this uneven terrain. Okay, so I hope I've made it clear throughout the last number of slides that permafrost thickness and extent in the active layer is highly variable. And just to sum up those factors, they include climate such as air temperature, precipitation, and snow cover and duration, as well as soil properties uh, and vegetation and drainage, all of which interact with each other. So this can be represented in an integrated systems approach where the buffer layer consists of snow and vegetation affecting the transfer of heat between the atmosphere and the active layer, which has an effect on permafrost stability. This effect is compounded by the accumulation of snow in the buffer layer, which is determined not only by the regional precipitation regime, but also by the snow trapping efficiency of above ground vegetation. The effects of the buffer layer on liquid water transport and retention may also have a major influence on heat transfer to the lower layers and again, permafrost stability. So this three layer model comprises three dynamic interfaces that have physical, biogeochemical and biological properties that change on the seasonal as well as much longer scales, including the multi-year cycles and shifts in the global climate.
The influence of water on permafrost can be significant, particularly during thaw and freeze up periods. When water turns to ice, it releases energy in the form of latent heat. During fall freeze up, this is called the zero curtain effect, which is a period of time where soil temperatures remain at approximately zero degrees Celsius due to the release of latent heat during the phase change of liquid water to ice. This latent heat released at the freezing front offsets heat loss of the atmosphere. And if there's sufficient water in the active layer, the freeze curtain can be extended. In this example here, we can see uh, ground temperature data ranging from five centimeters below the surface to 65 centimeters from June to October. And this period uh, from about mid-August to early September represents, represents the zero curtain period where ground temperatures at their surface and uh, to depth remain at approximately zero degrees Celsius. The length of the freeze current period can provide an indication of the water content in the active layer and provide insight into the amount of ice being formed uh, within the active layer during this time. While ice in the active layer is an important component in permafrost landscapes, ground ice content in the permafrost is where things get interesting. Ground ice is a commonly observed feature throughout high latitude regions and is responsible for many paraglacial landforms as it directly influences topography, geographic process, vegetation, and the response of the landscape to environmental change. Ground ice refers to all types of ice formed in freezing and frozen ground and occurs in pores, cavities, voids, and other openings in soil and rock. Quantitative assessments of ice content and excess ice content can be used to describe ground ice conditions for unconsolidated materials. Ice content of the soil is defined as the weight of ice to dry soil. So for example, if a soil sample weighed 100 grams when frozen and 40 grams when oven dried, then the weight of the ice or the moisture in that sample was 60 grams. And therefore the ice content is 150%. Ice content values of 40 to 50% are considered low, while high ice content values, which are typically in fine grained sediments, have values ranging from 50 to 150%. So in the uh, photos on the right, we can see a low ice content core, uh, which is primarily made up of sand, versus a high ice content core, which is in a silty clay material. Excess ice content refers to the volume of supernatant water present should a vertical column of frozen sediment be thawed. So in this case, you have samples and you allow them to thaw and the relative volumes of supersaturated sediment and standing water or excess ice are noted. And the volume of supernatant water is then expressed as a percentage of the total volume of sediment and water. The advantage of this index is that it provides some indication of the potential volumetric ground loss consequence upon thaw. Frozen sediments containing excess ice are thaw sensitive and may be con contrasted with thaw stable materials which contain no excess ice. The latter are not subject to thaw settlement and retain much of their mechanical strength when thawed. The terms massive ice or massive ice bodies are usually reserved for relatively pure ice bodies whose ice content by volume averages at least 250% for a thickness of several meters. So here is a video of three cores collected from Svalbard by Brendan O'Neill. Uh, and he's put them in uh, jars to then thaw. And we can see as they thaw the amount of water that is in excess. So the uh, beaker in the middle uh, is a very ice rich core, uh, core, which is why it's taking so long to thaw. However, there's a lot of excess water. So the volume of water to, uh, to set him is quite high. And this core would be uh, have very high uh, excess ice contents. There are a number of different types of ground ice, the first being pore ice. Pore ice is sometimes termed interstitial or cement ice and is the bonding material to hold soil grains together. It forms in capillary spaces by the in-situ freezing of moisture present within the sediment. This type of ice is widespread in near surface permafrost and in the active layer. And the core on the bottom is an example of an ice pore core uh, where it's cement ice or pore ice bonding the sand grains together. Segregated ice is formed by the migration of pore water to the frozen fringe where it forms discrete lenses or layers of ice. Segregated ice forms in a variety of materials, but water saturated fine grain sediments are most suitable. You can usually see the ice lenses with the naked eye uh, as they vary in thickness from, layer, uh, thickness from layers a few millimeters thick to massive ice bodies that are sometimes tens of meters thick. 
So the photo on the left is an example of a core with segregated ice lenses on the millimeter scale uh, versus the photo on the right shows massive segregated ice that's been exposed in the head wall of a retrogressive thaw slump on the Foshan Peninsula on Ellesmere Island. So the distinct, distinction between poor and segregated ice relates to the water content of the soil. So thinking back to the, how we quantitatively assess soil, or ground ice. Uh, so this is best determined by thawing the soil and noting the presence or absence of excess ice or supernatant water. If supernatant water is present, this indicates that the frozen soil was supersaturated and segregated ice was present. Vein ice is formed by the penetration of water into open fissures developed at the ground surface. So as frozen ground cools, ice and soils contract at varying rates, causing the development of tensile stress. This stress is relieved through the development of thermal contraction cracks in the winter, which typically occur when permafrost is below negative 13 degrees Celsius, with rates of cooling preceding cracking events typically exceeding 0.2 degrees Celsius per day for periods of several days. In the spring, snow water infiltrates a crack and forms to freeze uh, and freezes forming a wedge of ice which can then extend several meters below the ground surface. Vein ice can be distinguished from segregated ice on account of its vertical foliation and structures. So the photos uh, here show uh, different types of vein ice uh, where we see the thermal contraction crack on the left uh, and on the right we see again uh, from the side profile where we see a thermal contraction crack that was infilled with um, likely snow water, snow water or rain. Repetitive cracking over periods of millennium can produce large bodies of ice wedge, with wedge ice being one of the most common types of ground ice found throughout the Circum Arctic. So the schematic on the bottom left again just shows that um, cracking in the winter and then in the spring we have the infill of meltwater adding to the growth of that ice wedge. And on the photos on the right hand side here, we, on the left we have a syngenetic ice wedge that formed during sediment deposition on Banks Island. And on the right is a photo of an epigenetic ice wedge from the Taktiaktak area. So past climate conditions in this area of Canada are very favorable, favorable to ice wedge development, with many forming in drained lacustrian deposits. Intrusive ice is formed by water intrusion, usually under pressure. Seal and pingo ice are two types of intrusive ice that are usually identified. In these photos is an example of intrusive or injection ice that formed along the Inuvik to Taktiaktak Highway when water was injected under pressure into the stream banks and then froze in a tabular mass. And we can see um, the photo on the left with the two people standing beside it, and then on the right we can see that vertical mass of injection ice. This is a video of the formation of injection ice, again at a uh, culvert along the Inuvik to Taktiaktak Highway. So what's happening here is that water from further upstream in a catchment um, is moving downslope and becomes impeded by the road embankment, which freezes quite quickly in the fall. We'll begin to see water pile, uh, pool. So this water backs up and causes the ground to lift, as we can see by the, the willows. So you'll see the willows go above, uh, reaching the highest point on November 11th, uh, and then come to settle down. So during this process, water was also injected into the stream banks, um, forming injection ice, similar to what we saw in those previous photos. Buried or relict ice is considered to be larger bodies or layers of ice persistent cold climate conditions. It consists of snow, lake or river ice, as well as glacial ice, where sediment accumulates to a thickness sufficient to maintain an active layer arresting degradation of the underlying ice. So the photo on the right is from Banks Island, where I'm standing on about a meter of overburden, um, and under that is up tens of meters of buried Laurentide glacial ice. So this ice, um, this landscape is underlain by this ice, making it quite sensitive to any sort of change in air temperature. And buried glacial ice or relic ice is quite common in the Western Canadian Arctic, making this entire region quite sensitive uh, to changing permafrost conditions. Okay, so now a quick summary on ground ice. So ice poor permafrost is where permafrost ice volume is less than or equal to the soil pore space. So when ground ice melts in these types of permafrost environments, water is retained within the pore space and we don't often see any sort of change to the surface. So an example of this is the flow on the left, which is a sandy core uh, where we don't see any visible ice. Ice rich permafrost on the other hand is where the permafrost ice volume is greater than the soil pore space. So this is termed thaw sensitive terrain as when ice rich ice rich permafrost thaws, the excess water can't be retained, resulting in subsidence. And this is where we begin to see various and very interesting processes or the formation of different um, degradational landforms. And the photo on the right is an example of a core uh, within ice rich permafrost and its segregated ice lenses. 
Ground ice is perhaps one of the most important components of permafrost, as ground ice melt may trigger significant ecological change, damage infrastructure, and alter biogeochemical cycles. However, mapping ground ice is difficult, as it's a subsurface phenomenon and highly variable. New modeling of ground ice types by O'Neill et al. incorporates paleogeography to depict the distribution of three ground ice types, including segregated ice, wedge ice, and relict ice for northern Canada. The modeling uses an expert system approach and a geographic information system founded in conceptual principles gained from empirically based research to predict ground ice abundance in the near surface permafrost. While this modeling approach is a significant advance in permafrost mapping, additional field observations and volumetric ice estimates from more areas in Canada are required to improve calibration and validation of this model, as well as to improve small scale ground ice modeling. Our ability to um, map and understand what ground ice will be where is really important as we uh, continue to see these permafrost landscapes changing. Permafrost development and subsequent degradation is a result of a complex interaction of climatic and ecological processes. Schur and Jorgensen developed a permafrost classification system to describe these complex processes and how they relate to permafrost growth and long-term stability. So we start off the top left-hand corner under a very cold climatic scenario, such as we would find in the high Arctic, we can see the presence and stability of permafrost is climate driven. So here permafrost develops in the continuous permafrost zone uh, immediately after the surface is exposed to the atmosphere and even under shallow water. Climate-driven permafrost persists across the entire landscape in the high Arctic and initially forms on barren surfaces in the low Arctic, whereas where it is later modified during ecological succession. This type of permafrost, when it has high ground ice content, is very vulnerable to disturbance as rapid climate warming is expected in the next few centuries and will likely occur at a faster rate than ecological succession in these regions. So this is a photo, uh, the same photo actually from a couple slides ago from Banks Island, where there's tens of meters of massive ice um, lying just below approximately half a meter to a meter of overburden. So this ice has persisted since the last glaciation and is now undergoing accelerated permafrost degradation, partially in response to increasing air temperatures that cannot be buffered due to a lack of vegetation. The next type, climate-driven ecosystem modified permafrost, occurs in the continuous permafrost zone when vegetation succession and organic matter accumulation leads to development of an ice-rich layer at the top of the permafrost. This type of permafrost is less sensitive to climate change than climate-driven permafrost, but very sensitive to disturbance. For example, if fires remove that protective vegetative mat, the underlying permafrost will be much more vulnerable to change. Examples of this type of uh, permafrost are newly exposed surfaces such as sandbars and floodplains, as well as recently drained lakes. The formation of permafrost is initially climate driven, but once vegetation starts to form, this alters active layer depths and is accompanied by the accumulation of aggradational ice. We will find climate driven ecosystem protected permafrost in the subarctic, uh, and when it was formed under favorable climate, it still can persist under warmer climate conditions of the discontinuous permafrost zone, as long as it remains protected by those ecosystem properties. Once disturbed, climate driven ecosystem protected permafrost and its associated ground ice will not reestablish in the discontinuous zone, although the near surface can recover as ecosystem driven permafrost. The final type, ecosystem protected permafrost, persists as sporadic patches under warmer climates, but will not be reestablished after disturbance. The permafrost has the same characteristics as ecosystem driven permafrost. However, upon further warming or disturbance, the permafrost will start to degrade vertically from the top or laterally from expanding water bodies, for example, from collapsed scar fens and bogs. And that's what we see in this example here, uh, which is from a peat plateau bog complex uh, in the southern part of the NWT. So here we see these peat plateaus, which are the areas where there's trees, they're being degraded laterally from connected string, uh, connected bogs and fens, as well as vertically from increasing air temperatures. Understanding how permafrost landscapes form provides insight into the various permafrost landforms we would expect to see. For the next number of slides, I'm going to present examples of permafrost landforms that represent aggregational processes or landforms that are actively growing, and then contrast those same landforms with examples of how they would degrade. I'm not going to be able to cover all the different types of permafrost landforms as there's many, but we'll highlight some of the ones that I find most interesting. Uh, the photo on the right hand side is actually one of the examples that I'm going to discuss, which is the formation and degradation of polygonal terrain. 
So quite obviously, the opposite of permafrost aggradation is permafrost degradation. And specifically when speaking about permafrost degradation, I'll be using the term thermokarst. Thermokarst describes terrain that results from the thaw of ice-rich permafrost and develops due to a disruption of the thermal equilibrium of that said permafrost. So thawing of ice-rich permafrost leads to the compaction or settlement, the extent of which depends on the ice content of the frozen ground. Thermocars encompasses a suite of landforms that represent permafrost degradation, and these landforms are the surface manifestation of that degradation and change. Polygonal terrain is common throughout areas of continuous permafrost. The photo on the left is a 3D model of polygonal terrain and the underlying ice wedges, which helps us visualize the distribution of this ground ice type. Polygons are bounded by troughs, which delineate the underlying ice wedges. Polygonal terrain is one of the most widespread forms of pattern ground, and it is the surface expression of an ice wedge network. The photo on the right, uh, we can see the ice wedge network through the uh, development of, or the growth of shrubs, which are delineating those lower lying troughs where the shrubs have grown. And this is the underside of polygonal terrain, which offers a unique perspective on the distribution of that underground ice wedge network. This photo taken on Herschel Island in the Yukon shows an ice wedge that extends about five meters below the active layer. This ice wedge is part of a polygonal network. Since the top of the ice wedge corresponds to the depth of the active layer, any climate change related increase in the active layer will cause melting along the ice wedge and grand subsidence. And this is where we begin to see how these polygonal terrain networks degrade. So degrading polygonal terrain is common throughout the north, where we're beginning to see the top-down thaw of ice wedges. The black arrows here indicate where there's been subsidence or thaw of ice wedges, uh, and we see that they've been outcropping in the headwall of a retrogressive thaw slump on Banks Island. The inset photo of the ATV again provides some context of how these thawing troughs look like on the ground, and they definitely make getting around the tundra a bumpy ride. Here's a couple more examples of polygonal terrain degradation. The photo on the left is of degrading high-centered polygons, which consists of an elevated center surrounded by subsided troughs overlying partially degraded ice wedges. We see the formation of ponds here, often in troughs, or where the corners of multiple degrading ice wedges meet. In degrading low center polygons, which we see on the right, a central depression is outlined by elevated ridges that bound a trough overlying uh, the ice wedge. The next feature I'll talk about are pulses. So pulses are peat mounds that are cored with segregated ice lenses that can survive the summer due to insulation by a surface layer of peat. They vary in height from one to seven meters and are less than 100 meters in diameter. These features are common in wetlands in discontinuous and sporadic permafrost zones of Northern Canada, Scandinavia, and Russia. And then the summer southern limits of permafrost, they're almost like islands of permafrost with many showing signs of past or present collapse. So they originally formed through permafrost aggradation, giving them their distinct morphology and shape. However, with under a warming climate, permafrost aggradation has largely disappeared from discontinuous permafrost zones where these features are found. And models suggest that many pulses share an eco-hydrological trajectory towards complete thaw and replacement by Arctic fens. So the photos on the right show uh, pulses uh, in varying stage of thaw, stages of thaw. So we see at the edge of some of these peat mounds, we have the bricks of uh, organic material that are breaking away and collapsing into those ponds. And then the bottom fo photo shows the remnants of a pulsa. And we can see that really thick peat organic layer. So lithalsas are similar to pulsas, but ice segregation is not favored in organic material and instead favored by relatively high thermal conductivity of bare mineral soils. So lithalsas are peat, uh, sorry, permafrost mounds formed by ice segregation and mineral rich soils in the discontinuous permafrost zone. They're associated with fine grained lacustrine and alluvial deposits and often occur beside water bodies uh, as they form as permafrost aggrades into unconsolidated sediments where there's sufficient water and frost susceptible soil enabling ice segregation from the surface into the ground. These are relatively rare features that require a specific set of thermal, sedimentological, and hydrological site conditions in order to form, including fine-grained sediments, a low thermal regime, and an abundant water supply. I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about slope thermokarst. So these features do not represent aggradation of landforms and are purely examples of thermokarst. Mass movements that form in permafrost environments are very similar to their temperate counterparts, with the exception of ground ice. The first type of slope thermokarst is an active layer detachment. These failures represent translational landslides of soil, vegetation, and other surface materials in the seasonally thawed or thawing active layer. 
Material moves down slope, sliding over the thawing ice ridge zone within the active layer or the upper part of the permafrost. They are generally long, narrow, and shallow, less than two meters thick, and develop in response to a number of triggering mechanisms, including periods of high air temperatures and deep active layer thaw, summer rainfall events, and fire. Essentially, they are triggered by the development of high pore water pressures at the base of the active layer, which decreases the shear strength of the material, leading to failure. These features are common throughout the Arctic and often associated with the development of pressure because of thaw slumps should ice become exposed in the headwall. If not, these features typically occur as a one-off and will begin to stabilize. The photo on the left is a great example of an active layer detachment from Melville Island in Nunavut. In the foreground, you can see the crumpled mat and material that's uh, detached and moved down slope, uh, and then the bare area left behind uh, in the background. And these features can occur on relatively shallow slopes, um, 3 uh, to, to 6 degrees. A particularly striking form of thermokarst are retrogus of thaw slumps. Thaw slumps commonly develop in ice-rich glaciogenic deposits and are usually triggered by river, lake erosion, or disturbance of vegetation, for example from fire or the development of an active layer detachment. Once initiated, these features can expose large amounts of ice in their headwalls. The exposure of ice promotes melt and continuous back wasting and retreat, in some cases leading to extremely large features. These features move large amounts of material downslope, impacting downstream environments. It can also take a very long time to stabilize. Essentially, material or enough material needs to cover the ice wall, the ice face in the head wall, to minimize or stop melt and stop the retreat. So here's examples of thaw slums from the Northwest Territories. Here we can see a mass of granite is exposed in the head wall. These are often semicircular shaped. Um, which is distinct to their morphology of retrogressive thaw slumps, and they have material that runs out into the downstream system, in this case, which is a lake. Uh, down below, we have an example from the Mackenzie Mountains, where we have upwards of 10 meters of ground ice exposed in the headwall. Uh, again, we have this run out, uh, this debris tongue of material that moves into the downstream system. And adjacent to this, we can actually see evidence of an active layer detachment, uh, and also evidence of an older retrogressive thaw slump, or another type of mass movement, um, that happened in the past. When these features grow to a certain size, they've been termed mega slumps. So this is, uh, refers to a thaw slump that is greater than five hectares in area. And these features are quite common in the ice-rich glaciogenic deposits throughout the Western Canadian Arctic. Uh, this is an example of a mega slump on the Peel Plateau in the Northwest Territories. The distance across of this feature is over 700 meters. And the head wall in this case is over 30 meters high, which is equivalent to a 12 story building. Uh, and this is a building that we have here in Yellowknife. So the amount of material that's moved down slope is, a, um, is significant. And uh, in this case, it was calculated using drone surveys where the a pre disturbance surface was calculated, uh, subtracted from the post disturbance surface. And essentially, what was discovered was that the amount of material that was moved off of this slope into the downstream system was the same amount of material it took to build the 140 kilometer gravel road that connects Inuvik to Takdeaktak. This is a video collected from a drone of the same slump I showed in the previous slide. So it helps provide a bit of context in the size. So, looking up slope, we can see that massive headwall. As we move and look, down slope. Originally, when this material hit the valley, it caused the damming of the river and the formation of a small lake. The river has since cut through. Uh, so the infill in this river, sorry, the infill in this uh, valley is over 30 meters of thickness as well. And we can see as we move down slope, um, again, the size of this debris tongue. And again, just for scale, here's a helicopter with some people. Uh, and this debris tongue extends upwards of five kilometers down slope from the initial uh, initiation point. These features are also polycyclic in nature, meaning that they can reactivate within an already uh, stable or older scar. So this is another example of a retrogressive thaw slump uh, on the Dempster Highway. And this is one actually that's of significance as it's approaching the Dempster Highway and is of concern for infrastructure safety. So as we move upslope from the highway, we see again that formation, that debris, that material that moved downslope from the thaw of the headwalls. Uh, these features are often associated with additional, the formation of additional slumps where material pushed 
stream into the opposite bank, causing the formation of those two smaller retrogastathal slumps on the right-hand side that we're panning around right now. In this case, this is an example of a polycyclic slump where we see two head walls. Uh, the head wall in the background was the original head wall, uh, and then the head wall in the foreground actually just initiated in 2017. And in the following slide, I'm going to show you uh, trail cam footage of the retreat of these head walls and just how fast these features change. Here's footage from a trail camera of that same thaw slump um, showing how quickly these features change in a season. So here we have uh, the secondary head wall where we're primarily looking at and it's thawing, causing that debris or that slurry material that then moves down slope. The secondary head wall ultimately eats all the way into that primary head wall within one season in 2019. There's been an increase in the frequency and magnitude of these features forming across the Arctic uh, due to increasing air temperatures and changing precipitation regimes. And this has been documented through a number of different research projects um, by a number of different researchers across uh, the globe. Permafrost is the key factor that makes Arctic lands particularly sensitive to climate changes. The thermal state of permafrost is sensitive to changing climate conditions, and in particular to rising air temperatures and changing snow regimes. This is important because over the past few decades, the atmosphere in the polar and high elevation regions has warmed faster than anywhere else. Natural disturbances such as changing climate variables or fires impact permafrost stability, but so do human-induced changes. Uh, in this photo, we can see uh, the footprint in the Mackenzie Valley Winter Road. It's that um, thin linear structure snaking uh, across, the, across the landscape here. And here the natural vegetation has been removed, and over the years it's, it has subsided. Uh, so now it channels water in certain parts, fundamentally altering permafrost conditions. The influence of humans on permafrost landscapes and how we can minimize our impact will be discussed in more detail in the Cold Regions Engineering presentations. Projected increases in air temperatures and precipitation with Arctic amplification are anticipate, anticipated to intensify permafrost warming. Under the influence of larger heat transfers into the ground from the warming atmosphere, permafrost thaws and may become unstable. The Global Terrestrial Network on Permafrost has developed a database for thermal data and permafrost across the globe. This initiative established a per, uh, temperature reference baseline for permafrost and led to an increase in the number of accessible boreholes used for temperature monitoring. From this data, it was identified that permafrost temperatures have risen by up to 1.6 degrees Celsius in uh, circumpolar regions, with the largest increase in temperature occurring in the Arctic continuous permafrost zone. And we can see the, the boreholes worth showing the most steepest rise in temperature um, at the bottom, uh, upwards up towards the uh, boreholes that have about, have about negative five um, average permafrost temperatures. In part due to warming permafrost from increasing air temperatures, we're also seeing an increase in the frequency and magnitude of thaw-driven mass wasting and thermocarst. So this is just a quick example of how this change has manifested over three different time periods for a watershed near Klavik and the Beaufort Delta of the NWT. So the first figure shows an, uh, a count of the number of slumps or active slumps in this region. So between the 1986 and 2002, there was a fourfold increase in the number of active slumps. And then following that from 86, uh, sorry, from 2002 to 2018, there was another 2.5 fold increase. So the frequency of these uh, features are is increasing, but we also know the magnitude is increasing. So the middle figure is uh, area. And so the cumulative di uh, disturbance areas increased by 34 and 80 fold respectively over those intervals of time. We're also seeing a nonlinear increase in volume. Uh, the amount of and volume uh, is representing the amount of material being removed from these features by over two orders of magnitude over those three decades. And that's the final figure on the right. So the intensification of thaw-driven mass wasting is transforming the permafrost -lent terrain, coupling slopes with aquatic systems, and ultimately triggering a cascade of downstream effects uh, into those downstream ecosystems. And this is just one example of permafrost change and how this has direct impacts on downstream environments. In summary, permafrost is a thermal phenomenon and it's controlled by climatic and terrain factors such as relief, vegetation, hydrology, snow cover, soil and rock type. Its extent, its thermal profile, uh, the associated active layer are all related to these different climatic and terrain variables and often all interconnected um, and feedback from each other. 
Ground ice with impermafrost exerts a major effect on hydrology and ecology of the resulting geomorphic landforms, as well as thermocrust development. It's a really important piece of understanding how permafrost landscapes will change in the future. The rapid warming of permafrost soils impacts permafrost stability, not only in natural environments, but also for infrastructure in the north, such as roads, railway lines, pipelines, and aircraft runways. And this is not something that I touched on in detail, but will be discussed in much more uh, detail in the cold region engineering uh, pieces. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. Uh, I'm sorry I was not able to present live. Previous commitments have prevented me from doing that. I'd also like to thank PERN, the Canadian Permafrost Association, as well as the U.S. Permafrost Association for organizing this short course series, which I think is going to provide a lot of really valuable background information for those of you that are just getting started into this really exciting and, and changing uh, field. And then I'd like to say, please stay tuned for the next sessions, which is Simon Dume, who will be presenting Cold Regions Engineering 1, Ugalan Tui, who will do the second half of this permafrost science, and then Guy Doré, which will do Cold Regions Engineering 2. And if you have any questions, you can email me. Uh, it's located here. Uh, and then I will be attending the last session of this short course, which will be the panel. So please uh, reserve any questions for that time as well. Thank you and have a great day. All right. Well, I wish Ashley was here so that we could all give her a, a big round of applause. I think that was a super awesome presentation and it covered a really good portion of the basics of permafrost science. So we had uh, a few questions from Anna, but at this point, if uh, there's anyone who has questions, you can feel free to put it in the chat or we are at one o'clock. Uh, many of our lunch breaks are probably over. So if you want, you can post questions in the chat or we can say our goodbyes and you can hold on to some questions for the uh, permafrost science and engineering session at the end of the course. So thank you everyone. And just let me share one more thing. Next week, as oops, as Dr. Rudy has already said, we will have our final speaker being Simone Dumay talking to us about cold regions engineering. So hopefully we will see you all here next week.